If you are a first-time visitor to Calvary Chapel, I'll tell you right up front, you picked a strange time to visit Calvary Chapel, um, as we are going through some strange events in the book of Revelation, and it doesn't get more strange than as we come into chapter 13, and we're still looking at people and places, we're looking at behind-the-scenes events that are happening during the tribulation period. And uh, we're between the seventh trumpet judgment and the bull judgment. So from chapter 11 through chapter uh, 15, they're parenthetical chapters. In other words, they, they show us behind the scenes things that are taking place in the book of Revelation. And then we'll pick up the chronology when we get to chapter 16 with the bull judgments. That's the worst of all. So let's open up in a word of prayer and see what the Lord has for us here in Revelation 13. Heavenly Father, once again, <clears throat> we are humbled by your presence. We're humbled by your grace, your goodness, your love for us. We thank you, Lord, that you who began a good work in us, you are faithful to complete it. And Lord, we thank you for your word. We know that your word is living and it's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. And we need to have ears to hear what your spirit is saying to us, your church, your bride. And Lord, we thank you that you are on the throne and in control because as we look at the book of Revelation, things seem so out of control. But Lord, we know that it's all going to happen just as you say. Um, it's going to be brutal beyond our comprehension. But Lord, we thank you that you are going to take your bride home to be with you before this seven-year event known as the Great Tribulation. So, Lord, I pray that you would stir us up to love and good works, that we would be about your business, that we would be shining the light to those around us. Uh, we don't want to see anybody, any friend, any family member. We don't want to see people go through this horrendous time of great tribulation. And yet, Lord, we know many people will. And so I pray that we would continue to share the good news of Jesus with those around us. And we pray that you would be blessed and glorified as we look at your word. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. So turn with me to Revelation 13. Um, here in Revelation 13, the Apostle John was given, again, some amazing insights as he witnesses the rise of these two very diabolical uh, beasts, as they're called. Um, but they're human beings. One is known as the Antichrist. The other will be known as the false prophet. The first half of Revelation 13 deals with the rise of the Antichrist, uh, also known as the son of perdition. He's got a lot, long list of names that he's known as. And then the other one will be his right-hand man, the false prophet, who we'll see come on the scene as we look at the second half, Lord willing, next week. Um, we saw that the Antichrist shows up at the beginning of the seven-year period known as the Great Tribulation. Once the church is raptured out of here, the Antichrist will be revealed. He's probably a you know, politician somewhere on earth today, maybe a low-level politician. We don't know who he is. We won't know who he is because we'll be raptured, and then he will be revealed for who he is. Uh, the, one of the ways he'll be revealed is he'll make a peace treaty with the nation of Israel and with the Arabs, to allow them to rebuild the temple on the Temple Mount. When that agreement is made, that is the official beginning of the seven years of Great Tribulation. It's known as the 70th week of Daniel. Daniel's the one in Daniel 9, verses 24 to 27, that tells us it's that covenant that he signs with the Jews that allows him to rebuild the temple. That's the beginning of the final 70th week, or seven-year period, we call the Great Tribulation. Um, many Jews in Israel today, when you say, well, how will you know who your Messiah is? They'll say the one who brings peace to Israel or the one who allows us to rebuild the temple on the Temple Mount. Unfortunately, that'll be the Antichrist who will allow them to rebuild on the Temple Mount. Now, as we saw in chapter 12, once that temple is rebuilt, or actually in chapter 11, um, there's these two powerful prophets that are going to be speaking against the Antichrist because he comes on the scene as a peacemaker in chapter 6, verse 
1 and 2, when he's first revealed, he comes with peace, and he'll make this peace treaty with the Jews. But then, and we'll see this in this chapter, he becomes fully possessed by Satan himself. And he goes from being this peacemaker to being this diabolical ruler that is going to do anything and everything to destroy everybody on planet Earth who doesn't worship him as God. We'll talk more about this in a moment. But he's, he's allowed to put these two powerful prophets, I believe Moses and Elijah, in Revelation 11. Then he'll put them to death. It says their bodies lie in the street for three and a half days, and the whole world sees them. And then it says the whole world will witness these two dead bodies come back to life and then ascend up into heaven. Again, that's only possible in our time frame because 2,000 years ago, nobody could see what was happening in the whole world. Uh, you know, news traveled at the speed of a camel. But today, you know, people can see events all over the world. And so he puts them to death, and then he goes up to the temple, and he'll go into the temple. And this is what Daniel says is the abomination of desolation. Jesus reiterates this in Matthew 24, 15. When you see the abomination that causes desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, let the reader understand Paul talks about the same thing in uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, that he'll go into the temple and say, Worship me, I am God. That's the abomination that brings on desolation. That, that's when the Jews are told, Flee Jerusalem, get out of Israel, when that event takes place, because he is going to try to wipe out the Jewish people. So it's going to be a brutal time. Anyway, as we come into chapter 13, we see, again, behind the scenes, we'll see the, the rise up of the Antichrist and then later his right-hand man. You can call this, uh, I didn't title it this, but you can call this chapter the unholy trinity because even as we have a trinity that we worship, you know, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit points people to Jesus, Jesus points people to the Father, they're, you know, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, co-equal, co-eternal. There's an unholy trinity of Satan, and then he will possess the Antichrist, and then he will have the false prophet, and the false prophet will point everybody to the Antichrist, worship him. The Antichrist will get the glory to himself and then glorify Satan. So this is really a chapter of the unholy trinity. That's why I said if you're a visitor today, sorry, Again, that they have one objective when they come on the scene, when the Antichrist is fully possessed, and that's to steal, kill, and destroy as many people as possible before Jesus Christ returns to planet Earth. He has many names, but he's only called the Antichrist by the Apostle John. It's in 1 John chapter 2, verse 18. This is what John writes, Little children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, notice the Antichrist, it's a, it's a person. Even now, many Antichrists have come by which we know that it is the last hour. And it's in chapter 4, 1 John 4, verse 3, where he talks about these many Antichrists. They're, they're under the spirit of Antichrist. It says, every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. So the spirit of Antichrist is those around us. Many, many religions, they say, oh, we believe in Jesus, but, and then they'll give you some unbiblical definition of who they think Jesus is, like our neighbors to the west of us. Jesus is the spirit brother of Lucifer. He was a created being. No, he's not. If you don't believe that Jesus Christ came in the flesh, you know, as God, Emmanuel, God with us, that's the whole reason behind the virgin birth. God came in human flesh, lived a perfect life. He alone qualifies as the perfect sacrifice and Savior for us. If you don't believe that, then you got a different Jesus. The Jehovah's Witnesses say, oh, Jesus, he was created by, you know, Jehovah, and then... He is also Michael, the archangel of the Old Testament. That's not who Jesus is. Every cult has a version of Jesus. Only the Bible gives us the true version of who Jesus Christ really is. That's why we always have to go back to the scriptures. 
Satan has influenced many people over the years to come against the Word of God, to come against the doctrines concerning the true nature and the character of Jesus Christ and the genuine church of the living God. So we need to be on our toes at all times because the bride of Christ, which is who you and I are, the body of Christ, we're under constant attack by Satan and all of his minions. As we'll see, one of the primary ways Satan deceives people is through lying signs and wonders. And this has been going on all throughout the you know human history, lying signs and wonders. God does miracles. He is a God of wonderful signs and miracles and wonders, but Satan does have lying signs and wonders. One will always draw you closer to the Lord. The other one will draw you away from the Lord. Satan doesn't want you to believe in the one true God. He wants you to believe in yourself, put faith in your faith, or put your faith in some religion, but we're to keep our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul says this in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 9, the coming of the lawless one, that's the Antichrist, again, he has many names, is according to the working of Satan, and we'll see this here in a moment, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And so make no mistake about it, this world is going to see more deception than it's ever seen in its history once the Antichrist is revealed and comes on the scene, and, and we'll see here in a moment, Satan will possess him. So look at verse 1 of chapter 13. The Apostle John says, Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea. That phrase beast is used many times in Revelation, and most of the time it refers to the Antichrist. So he's seeing how the Antichrist comes into being. A beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads, ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Fortunately, we have another um, similar scenario. We have the, the definition of this given to us in the book of Daniel. Otherwise, you'd be going, now what in the world is this all about? Daniel sees the same thing as John sees here, and we also have a description of what this is from the book of Daniel. But it's in Revelation 17 that we see that the sea, because this beast comes out of the sea, represents, it'll tell us in, in Revelation 17, 9, multitudes of peoples, nations, and tongues. So the bottom line is, John witnesses the Antichrist rising up from among the nations, probably from Europe, as we'll see here in a moment. Notice also the Antichrist has ten horns, ten crowns upon those horns, and again, the, the prophet Daniel gives us some insights into this. Starting in Daniel chapter 7, verse 7, we see that the Antichrist will be the final world ruler on planet Earth before Christ returns. Daniel says, After this I saw in the night visions, and, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. Remember that phrase, iron. Iron represents the Roman Empire. It was devouring and breaking in pieces, trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. As I was considering the horns, there was another horn, a little one, coming up from among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. And there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking pompous words. And we'll see the exact same thing here in Revelation 13. This is the Antichrist. He will speak pompous or arrogant words. He will blaspheme God, those in heaven, and the temple of God. Daniel 7, verses 24 and 25, Daniel gets the interpretation of this vision. It says, The ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from his kingdom, and another shall arise after them. He shall be different from the first ones, and shall subdue three kings. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall indeed, or intend, to change times and law. 
Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. What is that? Three and a half years. And we'll see that mentioned here in a moment. This blasphemous name that he has speaks of the pompous, arrogant, boastful words that the Antichrist will speak against the Lord God Almighty and all those who belong to the Lord, the saints of God. Now look at verse 2. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, his feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. Take note of that. This is the description of the beast, the Antichrist. He is a composite of the four beasts that Daniel saw in the book of Daniel. So here in verse 13, God uses the same images that Daniel saw to tell us the nature, the identity of this beast known as the Antichrist. In Daniel 7, God shows him four beasts, and he describes four world empires. Uh, from Daniel's perspective, those four beasts were the beast that was like a lion. And these are in reverse order because now John is looking back at this from eternity future. He's looking back. So he sees the lion. What was the lion? Well, in Daniel's revelation, the lion represented Babylon. Babylon was then replaced by the Medo-Persians. That's the bear mentioned here. The bear in Daniel's prophecy was lopsided. It was one side was stronger than the other side. That represents the two nations, the Medo-Persian nation, the Medes and the Persians combined. One was stronger than the other. And then they were conquered by who? The Greeks. They were represented by the leopard that's mentioned here. The leopard is fast, and it speaks of Greece under Alexander the Great. He conquered the whole known world in 13 years. Then he dies, and then he's replaced by four um, of his generals. And then that's in Daniel chapter 11. But then there's one that will conquer them, and that was this beast that has iron. So remember the statue Daniel saw the vision of? One of the interpretation, Nebuchadnezzar saw the statue. It had a head of gold. And Daniel says, that's, your, that's you, Nebuchadnezzar. You're the head of gold. That's Babylon. Then there's the chest of silver. That was the Medo-Persian Empire. The bronze stomach, that was the Greek Empire. And then he says, the legs of iron, that would be the Roman Empire. And then he says, in the last days, there's ten toes of iron mixed with clay. And that represents, in the last days, it says, this revived Roman Empire. And then he sees in this vision, this mountain not cut with hands. It strikes this image and turns it all to powder. And that's Jesus, the Messiah, coming back and wiping everything out and setting up his kingdom. That's what Daniel sees. And so that's what John is witnessing here, the rise of this Roman Empire. Iron teeth. This is the last days. This Roman Empire will come back to being, and the Antichrist will be the one who will oversee this. So here in Revelation 13, John sees this composite picture of these beasts, the same beasts that Daniel saw. The Antichrist, again at the end of verse 2, notice Satan, or the dragon, empowers him, gives him all of his power, all of his authority. In other words, Satan comes to the Antichrist with a proposition. Bow down and worship me, and I will give you all these kingdoms. I'll give you all of my power and authority. Do you remember who Satan did that with earlier in the Gospels? Jesus. He came in the three temptations, and he tempts Jesus three times. And one of those temptations, it's found in Luke chapter 4. Look at these verses, verses 5 through 8. Then the devil, taking him up on a high mountain, again, Satan tempting Jesus, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, All this authority I will give you and their glory, for this has been delivered to me. And I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours. In other words, he had the authority to do this. Why? Because we talked about this earlier on in Revelation. When Adam and Eve fell, 
It's like, okay, when God created Adam and Eve, he gave them dominion over all the earth, all the animals, over every living creature. It's like he gave them the title deed to planet earth. This belongs to you. Satan comes, tempts them. They fall into sin. They forfeited that title deed over planet earth to Satan. Satan is known as the God of this world. Satan then offers it to Jesus. Jesus says, no. He's going to offer it to the Antichrist, and he'll say yes. But at the same time, we see Jesus taking the, I believe, the title deed out of the Father's hand back in Revelation 5, a seal of seven seals. And as he opens each seal, a judgment comes out. So ultimately, Jesus wins. God will prevail. Satan will fail. So Jesus says and answered him, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. But again, this tells us that as the God of this world, Satan has the authority to whomever he wishes, and he gives this to the Antichrist. Don't forget, he is the Antichrist. Anti has two meanings. He's against Christ, but it also means in place of Christ. When he comes on the scene, people are actually going to think he is the real Messiah. But he's the anti-Messiah. He comes in replacing the true Messiah. But he'll be found out shortly. You know, once he you know starts doing his diabolical stuff, people will realize he's not the real Messiah. Well, look at verse 3. John says, And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. So again, the whole world's going to marvel after the Antichrist. They're going to follow him because his deadly wound was healed. Some think of this as the Roman Empire being restored, but I lean towards, and other scriptures point to a person, the Antichrist, being mortally wounded, and then he appears to come back to life. It's his version of the resurrection. He's going to make people think, see, I'm the real Savior. Look what happened to me, but now I'm alive. Now, remember, when Jesus was crucified, the only ones that took him off the cross were Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. They lay him in the tomb. Who saw him go into the tomb? Mary Magdalene and a few other women. That was it. When he rose from the dead, who saw him? Well, nobody at first, because an angel descends, the only ones at the tomb were the guards, the Roman soldiers, and they freak out because an angel rolls the stone away. There's an earthquake. But then Jesus doesn't appear until later that day, well, that morning, to Mary Magdalene, some of the other women, eventually to the two men on the road to Emmaus. That evening he appears to the disciples, and then for the next 40 days he only appeared to his disciples. At one time he appears to 500. That's all he appeared to. That's why the world's like, oh, we don't believe in a resurrection. We didn't see it. When this happens, the whole world will witness this so-called resurrection, and they will marvel after him. They will follow after the Antichrist. Now, in Zechariah, look at these verses. This could pertain to what happens to the Antichrist. Zechariah 11, verse 16 says, For indeed I will raise up a shepherd in the land who will not care for those who are cut off, nor seek the young men, nor heal those who are broken, nor feed those who are who, uh, feed those that still stand, but he will eat the flesh of the fat and tear their hooves in pieces. Woe to the worthless shepherd who leaves the flock. A sword shall be against him, or against his arm, and against his right eye. His arm shall be completely withered, and his right eye shall be totally blinded. So interesting. A sword is taken to him. Now, I've always pictured this as um, after he puts the two witnesses to death, chapter 11, he goes into the temple, says, Worship me, I'm God. And I've always pictured some hot-headed you know, Jewish person going after him, either you know, like a sniper taking him out, or here it says a sword, maybe somebody stabs him, and he dies. It looks like he dies, but he comes back to life, but his right arm is withered, and his eye is blinded. But everybody marvels after him. Some think this is why he'll say you have to have a mark, the mark of the beast at the end of chapter 13, has to be on your forehead, by your eye, or on your right hand, maybe representing, see, 
He was he went through this for us, you know. He was wounded for us, so we'll take that mark. We'll take that stamp on our right hand. Who knows? But look at verse 4. This is what he's always wanted. So they worshipped the dragon, again, that's Satan, who gave authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, the Antichrist, saying, who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? So again, this is Satan's highest achievement. He has always wanted worship. He's always wanted to be exalted. He's always wanted to be made equal to God. Remember the lie in the garden was when Satan tells Eve, you're not going to die, but you'll be just like God. That is called the lie. Um, it's spoken of in Romans 1. It's called the lie. The lie is you don't need God. You are a God or you can become a God or you're equal to God. In 2 Thessalonians 2, Paul refers to it as the lie. That's the lie. And so who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Isaiah chapter 14. Here's where we see Satan wanted to be worshipped. As Lucifer, he wanted to worship just like God the Father. Isaiah 14 verse 13. Speaking of Lucifer, for you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. So there's the lie. I'll be just like God. And here's God's response, yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. So here in Revelation 13, Satan gets what he has always longed for, worship. He wants people to worship him, bow down before him. And they will as they worship the Antichrist and follow after the Antichrist. And Satan is going to glory in this. We'll see that it's because of his lying signs and wonders that most people will be deceived into believing that this is being done by God when it's actually being done by Satan. More on that later in this chapter. This is why, as believers in Jesus Christ, we have to stay true to the Word of God. You can't go away from the Word of God. You need to filter everything you hear whether it's up here or on TV or wherever you're reading or listening to messages, you've got to filter everything that's being said through the Word of God. God's Word is the final authority, not me, not Pastor Chuck, not anybody out there. Certainly not so-called apostles and prophets today. There's a movement out there that you need to be very, very careful of. N-A-R. Heard of that? The NAR, New Apostolic Reformation. There's a lot of groups behind this. Bethel Church is part of the NAR movement. Hillsong was part of it. They're collapsing, praise the Lord, quickly after they've been exposed for being so many liars and deceivers in that movement. But NAR simply means the New Apostolic Reformation. In other words, we have all these apostles and prophets that we're raising up, and they're going to turn the world upside down for Jesus, and we're going to clean out hospitals. It's the same lie that I heard 40 years ago by John Wimber. He prophesied that within two years, every hospital is going to be cleared out. We're going to have stadiums filled with people having resurrection services, no more football and baseball games. Shouldn't have said two years because that proved him to be a false prophet. But that's what they would say. We're going to make the world Christian, and only then will Jesus be able to come back and set up his kingdom. That's disappointing, because our world's going down the tubes. Spiritually, we're not getting closer to the Lord. We're falling away from the Lord, and yet they falsely believe. you got to listen to our apostles, our prophets. Even though they'll say things contrary to the word of God, they'll trump God's word. They'll think our word is equal to or we have new revelation from God. That's what all the cults do. So be very careful when you hear of the new apostolic reformation. It is dangerous. Everything must come through filtered by the word of God. If it doesn't you know, pass the test, don't believe it. Don't buy into it. We have many scriptures that warn us. 1 John 4 verse 1. The apostle writes, Beloved, do not believe every spirit but test the spirits whether they are of God. Because many 
False prophets have gone out into the world. 1 Corinthians 14, 29, the Apostle Paul says, Let two or three prophets speak, and let the others judge. I thought we're not supposed to judge. No, we are to judge. The word judge there means discern. Yeah, you let somebody speak. I got a word from the Lord. And I've had people over the years say, I got a word from the Lord. Okay, I'll listen. Most of the time it's been, that's not from God. <laughs> that's not even close to the word of God. So you have to discern. And again, you have to know the word of God. You got to fall back on the truth of God's word. Jesus says in Matthew 7, 15, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. So there'll be those who, they look like sheep. They probably smell like sheep, but they'll come to you in wolves' clothing. They will try to devour you. Be careful. As followers of Christ, we must test and judge, use God's wisdom and discernment to... Find out whether or not what somebody claims is from God is actually from the Lord. Be very careful. If anybody comes with a different gospel, point them to Galatians chapter 1. Because Paul says in Galatians 1, if somebody comes with a different gospel, let him be accursed or anathema. Because there's only one gospel that saved. Jesus Christ came from heaven to earth, born of the virgin, lived a perfect life because only he qualified to be the perfect sacrifice for our sins. Only his perfect spotless blood that we sang about during communion can pay the price for your sins. Only Jesus was laid in the tomb and rose in the third day according to the scriptures. That's the gospel. And somebody will come with all these new gospels, new and improved messages. Be careful. There's only one gospel that saves. And as I mentioned earlier, our friends to the West, they have a different gospel. Jesus is not the spirit brother of Lucifer. They'll say the new gospel is, you know, you're, you're saved by grace after everything you can do on your own. That's not the gospel. How is a person saved? By faith alone in Christ alone. Remember the Philippian jailer? Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Asking Silas and Paul. They said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Period. Your faith in Christ. He did the work that you cannot do. And when you receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you become a member of the body of Christ. You're a new creation in Christ. All the old things pass away and everything becomes brand new. So be careful with those around you. So here's the last question here in verse 4. Who is able to make war with him? I mean, this guy's indestructible. Well, we'll see in chapter 19, there is one who will make war with him and destroy him. He's going to whoop him, and that's Jesus. So yes, there is an answer to that question. Not at this moment, but at the end of the Great Tribulation. Look at verse 5. And he, speaking of the Antichrist, was given a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for 42 months. How long is that? Three and a half years. What else have we seen in Revelation? 1,260 days. What is that? Three and a half years. We've seen time times and half a time. Three and a half years. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. That'll be you and me. We're going to be in the heavens with the Lord. We'll be in glory with the Lord. But he's going to blaspheme God. He's going to blaspheme his place in heaven. He's going to blaspheme us, the saints of God, the body of Christ. But notice, first of all, the Antichrist was given a mouth. Earlier it says he was given authority. Now, this is important because Satan is the one who gives him his power, his great authority. But don't forget the ultimate Power and authority belongs to God. Satan cannot do anything in this world unless God allows it. You can't be, you know, no Christian can be possessed, but you can't even be hassled or oppressed, depressed by Satan or the demons unless God allows it. 
he, they are under the authority of God. God will allow them to do certain things, but they can only go so far. God is sovereign. He is in control. Satan and the Antichrist cannot do anything more than what God says. Even the length of time that they are able to do these dastardly deeds is limited by God to what? 42 months, three and a half years. The same principle applied when Jesus was brought before Pontius Pilate. And, you know, Pilate tells him, you know, I could put you to death. I could set you free. Remember that? This is what we read in John chapter 19, verse 10. Then Pilate said to him, Are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have power? That word is authority, same one given here of Satan to the Antichrist. I have power to crucify you and power to release you. Jesus answered, You could have no power at all against me unless it had been given you, there it is, given you from above. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. So again, the ultimate power is from God the Father. He gave Pilate permission to have Jesus crucified. It was God who allows Satan and the Antichrist to have this authority for these final three and a half years. And so, always the one to take advantage of what God allows him to do. Satan will blaspheme the Lord. He will blaspheme his holy name, his tabernacle, as it says here, and all of us who are in heaven. And again, what is blasphemy? It simply means he speaks pro profanely against God. He trash talks God and his you know, holy place in heaven. He trash talks you and me. He ridicules us. He loves to ridicule our faith. He loves to speak wicked, evil lies against God and his word. He mocks Jesus. He mocks the power of the blood to cleanse the sinner of all their sins. He will mock the reality of the resurrection. He mocks the power of the gospel to save. That's what he can do. That's all he can do. He tries to keep people from coming into the kingdom of God. Now, when Jesus was rebuking the religious leaders who were opposing him, who are opposing his ministry, these are some harsh words that Jesus says to these religious leaders in Israel. John chapter 8, verse 44. Look at these, this verse here. He says to them, You are of your father the devil. That's not very seeker sensitive, is it? He's not trying to win a crowd here. He just tells them, You are of your father the devil. In the desires of your father, you want to do. What did they want to do? They wanted to kill Jesus. That's why he's saying this to them. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. And we see the fallout of Satan's lies throughout the world today as the vast majority of human beings have rejected the truth of God's word. They put their faith and trust in everything and anything but Jesus. I mean, you could just watch the news. What are people putting their faith and trust in? Politics or the environment or religion. Satan does not want anybody to know the truth of who Jesus Christ is that he alone is the savior of our lives. So don't be distracted. Keep coming back to the word. Look at verse 7. John writes, It was granted to him, again, granted to him, to make war with the saints, uh-oh, and to overcome them, wait a minute, and authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. So when you look at this, a lot of Christians, don't be stumbled by this. You know, a lot of Christians say, well, wait, wait a minute. He's not supposed to have any authority over the saints. He's not supposed to be able to come against the bride of Christ. Is that who he's talking about here? No. There's three classifications of saints in the Bible. There's Old Testament saints, and you become a saint or one set apart by God by simply believing the word of God. So even before the Jews, before God took Abraham and made the Jewish nation through Abraham, you had Old Testament saints like Enoch, Methuselah, 
uh, Job, Noah, they're Old Testament saints. You have Old Testament saints like King David, King Hezekiah. There's eight good kings. They're Old Testament saints because they put their faith and trust in God and His Word, like Daniel, all the Old Testament prophets. But there's New Testament saints, which are you and me. We are the bride of Christ. We're the, the body of Christ. That classification of saints are from the day of Pentecost, when the first saints of the bride of Christ were all Jews. For about 10 years, there were only Jews coming into the church. And then God used Saul of Tarsus to stir them up to take the gospel out because he was bringing persecution against the saints in Jerusalem. And so the church finally starts taking the gospel out to the Samaritans, then the Gentiles throughout the world. So from Pentecost to the rapture, that's the bride of Christ. We are the New Testament saints. But the third classification of saints are what we call the tribulation saints. After we're raptured, many from every tribe, tongue, nation are going to come to Christ for salvation. The Bible says, and we already saw this in Revelation earlier, that these, old, uh, these tribulation saints will serve the Lord forever and ever. We're the bride of Christ. We're going to be dwelling and ruling and reigning with Him. They will serve the Lord. So these three different classifications of saints, don't get that confused, because we're not the ones that He's going to overcome. These three classifications are very important, though. Old Testament saints, New Testament bride, church, and then these tribulation saints. So, we read in Matthew chapter 16, verse 16, Jesus just asked the disciples, who do men say that I am? The all-important question. Peter says, Matthew 16, 16, Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades, or hell, shall not prevail against it. Praise the Lord. Again, from Pentecost to the rapture, the bride of Christ, Satan cannot prevail against us. Yeah, he can hassle us all he wants, but he's not going to be able to put us to death. We are safe and secure in the hands of the Lord. Our days are numbered by the Lord. Here he's able to prevail against these tribulation saints. By the way, when we go to Israel and we're up there in Caesarea Philippi, that's where Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And when Jesus says, upon this rock, I'm going to build my church, he says, first of all, he says, you're Peter. What does Peter mean? Little stone. When we're standing at the base of this massive rock known as you know, Caesarea Philippi, there's this massive rock there, and there's all these little stones all over the place. Jesus picks up a little stone. You're Peter, little stone. But upon this rock, I'll build my church. What's the rock? Peter? Absolutely not. Peter stumbled and bumbled. He'll deny the Lord. But even after Pentecost, he'll be called a hypocrite by the Apostle Paul. He's not the rock. His statement that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, that's what we build our lives on. That's the solid foundation Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians 3. He's the rock. Be careful. Take heed how you build on that foundation. No other foundation can be laid than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So don't think of Peter as the rock. He's just a little stone. But upon that statement, that's where Jesus will build his church, and the gates of hell will not, shall not prevail against it. So let's wrap this up here. In verse 8, he says, all who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And so everyone whose name is not written in the Lamb's book of life, they're going to start worshiping the Antichrist. Unbelievable. This will be the epitome of a one world religion. This is what the world's pushing towards right now. When you see some of these things that are happening with the World Economic Forum, Davos and the rest, they all gather together. How can we have a one world? They're pushing economy. We'll see that in the end of this chapter, how they're going to do it. We need a one world religion. So there's not so much fighting among all the religions. 
We need a one world. They fill in the blank. They want it all to be one. Under the Antichrist, eventually it will become one. But what lies and what deception the world's going to believe when this world ruler comes on the scene. And it's easy to see how mankind continually falls for this. I mean, look back 80 years ago during World War II, so many were worshiping Adolf Hitler. So many were worshiping Mao Zedong. So many were worshiping Joseph Stalin, even though he put 20 million of his own people to death. People today worship leaders and, and government officials. They, they just put their hope and trust in Washington, D.C. or whatever it might be. Our hope has to always be in Jesus. And when this guy comes on the scene, he's going to be a hundred times more spiritual than any world religious leader has ever been. He's going to be more charismatic than all these world rulers have ever been. He's going to be, you know, so persuasive and charming that he'll be a hundred times more deadly than any of them. The big question to take note of here is the Lamb's Book of Life. Is your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? A lot of churches will have their list of church members. I don't really care if you have your name written in a church membership anywhere. I mean, I've had people tell me, well, yeah, I'm going to heaven. My name is in the church membership of such and such a church. <laughs> that doesn't count. There's only one name your name needs to be in, and that's the Lamb's Book of Life. If it's not there, that's why we don't have a so-called church membership. You belong to Jesus? If you're good enough for Jesus, you're good enough for Calvary Chapel. Come on. I mean, it's pretty simple. If you love Jesus, we love you. You know, if you hate Jesus, we don't want you around. It's his membership that matters, not if you have a church membership. Church memberships can be fine. Nothing wrong with it. They have their advantages, but they also have some disadvantages. The only one that counts is, do you have your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? Now, there's only one way to be sure of that. Have you put your faith in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation? It's not by any works. It's not by any good deeds you could do. It's not by trying your hardest to keep the Ten Commandments because we all fail. It's by putting your faith in Jesus. He loves you. He died on the cross. He demonstrated his own love toward you. And while you were still in your sins, he died for you. He paid the price, his blood, to cleanse you of all of your unrighteousness. So what can you do to add to that? Nothing. For by grace you've been saved through faith. That not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So all you can do is say, Lord, I'm a sinner, and you died on the cross for sinners. You shed your blood for my sin. And so you rose from the dead, and because he's alive today, he alone can come into your life and give you everlasting, never-ending life. That's why it's called good news or the gospel of Christ. He did everything for us. You know, it's kind of summed up there in Isaiah 53, verse 6, where it says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of of us all. Make sure you have your name written in the Lamb's book of life. Verse 9, if anyone has an ear, let him hear. Now, we saw that phrase seven times in Re chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation. Is something missing from this line here? If anyone has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The church is gone, and so now he's telling anybody on planet Earth, if anyone has an ear, let him hear. The church is not here at this point. But in chapters 2 and 3, if you have an ear to hear, let, the, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. Again, be patient. He's, refer he's speaking to the tribulation saints here. Be patient. You are going to face horrendous times. To anyone who will listen, he says, during the great tribulation, this is for you. You're going to die at the hands of the Antichrist. 
but hang in there. Even if you're put to death, I'm going to give you eternal life. You're going to dwell with me forever and ever. They're going to put many, many people to death, the, the, the enemy, the Antichrist. The Antichrist is going to lead people into the Battle of Armageddon that we'll read about in chapter 16. Satan wants to steal, kill, and destroy as many as he can, and he'll destroy so many. Most of them will die without Jesus. They'll be lost and they'll perish forever. But there are tribulation saints, multitudes, it says, from every tribe, tongue, and nation who will receive Jesus. So Satan's doing all that he can because he knows his time is short. He only has the final three and a half years from this point on to do what he can do to destroy. But Jesus, as we'll see, prevails. Because not only will the Antichrist and the false prophet be locked up and suffer for eternity in the lake of fire, when Jesus returns, Satan will be put in the abyss for a thousand years. He'll be let loose for a short time, it says, and then he will be thrown into the lake of fire that burns forever and ever. So the bottom line, don't ever forget, our God wins. Jesus prevails. Satan will fail. So hang in there with the Lord and rejoice, as Jesus says to the disciples when they come back all excited after he sent them out to do all these wonderful signs and wonders, and they come back all excited. Even the demons believed. Even they had to obey us. They didn't believe, but they had to obey us. And Jesus says, that's fine, but rejoice in this, that your name is written in the book of life.